down and Ronaldo, yes! Yes! David Beckham has done it! Big time! Hello and welcome to the Head Owen Sever Uncharted Podcast. Sever, welcome. Thanks, Matty. Cheers, brother. What about the feedback we've had this week, mate? It's yeah. been uh, it's been pretty good for our first episode last week. It's been very good, very positive. Now, we've got our first guest on the line who's um, in Queensland as we speak. So, uh, let's get straight to it. Former Socceroo, Michael Thwaite. Thwaitey, welcome to the Head Owen Sever Uncharted podcast. Thanks, guys, and it's an absolute pre- pleasure to be the, the first guest Brilliant, mate. Now, we're going to run through all the same topics we spoke about last week, Sever. So we're going to run through the transitioning from athlete into the normal world, a lot of mental health, all the clubs you played at, and um, get your opinion on the state of the game at the moment. So, look, we really appreciate you coming on, mate. Thank you. It's, um, yeah, it's, a, it's a rough time of the night uh, for any family person. So, um, But I've, I've got the okay for the wife, uh, uh, on the ballet run after work, uh, in between soccer. So uh, you got me at a real good time. Seven per- o'clock kicked off. <laughs> Perfect, mate. We, we certainly understand what witching hour is like at home. Let, <laughs> let me tell you. So, Thwaiti, let's get started, mate. So uh, 13 caps for the Socceroos over your career. Can we just run through that and, and how privileged you are to have played for Australia? Yeah, for sure. I guess uh, I remember Ange Postacoglu once saying, you know, it's it, it, you know in a player's career, um, you know, to play for your country is probably you know the the best achievement that you can ever do. And I guess I remember that game uh, against Jamaica and we won five nil in England, uh, just walking out. And um, when I was growing up, I actually never bought a Socceroos jersey. It was one thing that I prided myself on that I wanted to earn. And uh, when I got that, you know, that Nike strip. At the time, uh, it was it was an amazing feeling. Perfect, uh, and that's what we talk about, right? Athletes are certainly wired differently, right? And that and you see you see those those ones who are wired differently make it to the top. Yeah, special breed, special breed kind of athlete. And uh, so those thirteen caps for the Socceroos uh, played in the A League for the Wanderers, Gold Coast, Melbourne Victory, and Perth Glory. Yep, correct. And met Seva on the Gold Coast. Yeah, that's right. Um, in, in the third season of Gold Coast United, unfortunately the last season because hopefully uh, now it will be a different story now that I'm playing um, at a semi-pro level and the club's you know, doing different things how it used to be. But yeah, it was a pretty crazy season for us um, to, to play and, and for our families, you know, young families. And then also played overseas in Romania, Poland, Norway and then finished your overseas journey in China. Yeah, I mean, yeah, going to those Eastern European com- countries was like very different. I grew up in Cairns uh, until I was 18, so it was about plus 30. And, you know, <laughs> during winter, those, those countries got to, to minus 30. So, uh, yeah, a little bit different than the far north, I think. And I asked Sever this last week as well. Did you find it hard going over there and playing football, like coming from Australia, then going over to those European countries, getting used to the cold and all that sort of stuff? I think for Australian players at the time, um, you know, there was a handful of players that really um, set the tone for for overseas, you know, including Frank Farina, uh, Jordan Cosmina, those those players um, back in the day who are now coaches. But the NSL finished in, in, in 2004 and uh, after playing two years for Marconi and, and it was a real, you know, question mark over people's career. Like most, I think even I had the chance to go back to State League, but I really wanted to, to make it over in Europe and uh, went on a few trials and that was a real eye-opener, you know. I guess when we when we bring foreigners here, we, you know, we, we, we put the red carpet out, we, we treat them with respect, we show them houses, but then... You know, in my first trials, I remember in France, I went to Auxerre, which is one of the best um, development for youth players. I remember my first 5v5, I got elbowed in the lip off the ball. And, you know, I was crying and, and talking to my, my family overseas and, you know, had a couple of failed um, trials um, over there before finally going to Romania via, um, via a DVD. He was just doing well in the under, at the Under-20 World Cup and I uh, gave my DVD to John McCain to give to his Romanian coach and which ended up being a, a blessing uh, where I signed a two-year deal in Romania at National Bucharest with um, three other Australians. And did that help you settle in there, having three other Australians at the time? 
Oh, for, for sure. Like, um, we felt we were living like kings, you know. Like, I was single at the time, um, you know, getting up to mischief, of course. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, you know, we were living at the hotel in the stadium. And, you know, as, as so you know, like, in Italy, and it's, it's the same sort of thing. Um, the culture is so set where, you know, you don't have to pay for anything. You know, the taxis are cheap there. You roll out of bed, you go on a training um, everything's done for you. So, and, and living with those Australians, as you said, um, makes it so much easier. And, and that's how agents work. You know, they might put a couple of players together just to feel uh, comfortable and make um, the stay easier because it's, yeah, different climates, different language, different food, away from family, uh, time zone. There's so many elements against you. And I guess that's, that's where the top players can have a long career there. Like, unfortunately, I, I only played... Um, just over four seasons in Europe and then obviously one in China later on. But, um, yeah, that, that's, that's the difference between making it over there and not. It's, it's great insight, right, Seva? Like, on, on, you and I have had that conversation as well on, on how hard it was living overseas, living in those countries. Like you said last week, different food. Just oh, different yeah. facilities, like you're not living in. You've got to find your own bed. Like you've got to get used to everything again. Yeah, I, I didn't. Um, I didn't get the, uh, the the elbows to the face or anything like that. To be honest, I was. I went over there and uh, I was pretty much wrapped in cotton wool. To be honest, it was it was an easy transition for me. But then once you start finding your feet. They know not to throw the hard stuff at you straight away. Then once you know you start learning the language, understanding the players and that, uh, then they then they start testing you. And that's what I found. I found yeah, cause I only, I went over at seventeen. So yeah, I wasn't I wasn't an adult. I wasn't a kid. I was in that 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 in between sort of a stage. So I went straight into the youth team and then into the first team six months later. So it was one of those ones where it was good, but I didn't get a hard period for a long time. I sort of got the respect straight away. So, and I, Swadi, I asked Seva last week: Was it a real eye opener about training and facilities in comparison to Australia? Oh, for sure. I remember when I transferred to to Poland at Wisła Krakow. This is the top team, um, and you know, like your first session, I remember someone trying to go through my ankle, and then what I learned, you know, from my trials in France, and then obviously my time in Romania, just developed you know, a, a tough skin, you know, not to react and then obviously to associate yourself with maybe the better players there and, and surround yourself with those good people. But yeah, I remember some of the, the pre-seasons with Dan Petrescu, who was a fantastic player in Romania and, and, and in the EPL. Um, you know, we're doing triple sessions with, with, with wow. without even thinking about it. And, you know, training before breakfast, forest runs, um, technical sessions, tactical, uh, what, I, what I experienced in the A-League, you know, we had it easy, you know, where you kind of molded around 90 minutes of training and then you got the players' union and all these things helping you out where they make it a lot more smoother and it's, it's um, yeah, it's better for transition, in, I guess. In terms, of, uh, in terms of when someone says full-time players, in respect to the A-League, how you train maybe four sessions a week plus a game, you get a day off. If you really think of it, it's not really full time compared to what you just spoke about there, where you're training maybe eight nine sessions a week. Yeah. So are we yeah. part time, or you know, you, you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I mean, it get, it, it's getting to that point. It depends which coach I think. You know, under yeah. like a Tony Popovich, um, he was very very much in tune with the European. Like, you, uh, as a thirty, I think I was thirty four at the time. And going on 35, it's probably the hardest preseason that I did with the Wanderers and, and the fittest that I've been. But he knows how to break you and how to make you, I guess. Um, but, yeah, like even the old NSL, like I was studying full-time at Sydney University when I first moved down from Cairns. And I remember Raul Blanco, um, you know, who was the first coach to give me the chance. Um, you know, we, I, was, I was studying all day. We're doing two double sessions a week um, and, you know, I had no car. Thank, thank God that I had a, you know, I met Grant last, which which used to drive me back in the day. Um, but I was catching train, you know, for almost two hours of bus to Bosley Park, then all the way back to North Shore pretty much every day. But, yeah, we were doing, like, full-time training. That was back in the NSL. And obviously the, the wages were kind of part-time, weren't they, you know? So 
Uh, I guess some players weren't. <laughs> but <laughs> I, was, I think my first contract was about ten thousand dollars. So um, yeah, it was. Uh, but yeah, you just do it because you know you're eighteen, nineteen, looking to you know to to make a career of yourself. And you want to crack. All right, mate. Let's take it. Let's go right back to Cairns, and uh, you, you grew up in Cairns, and obviously that's where football started for you. Yeah, so I started playing uh, soccer, football at, at seven years old uh, at Saints Soccer Club, and I played for that club for ten years. And I think, you know, looking at the players now, you know, a lot of young players are moving clubs. They're looking to decide whether to play MPL or not. But I guess we need to make that club junior grassroots level a lot lot stronger um and yeah i played at one club for 10 years um right until i was 17 and then the club merged with another club uh, before i went to sydney so but i felt that loyalty and 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 that culture within that club um in cairns how old were you when you um when you moved to sydney i was uh i was just out of my first year of university so i was 18 yeah wow. so okay. in 2002 um, and you had, yeah, I'd say like about 12 years old was when when I first uh, was really supporting the Brisbane Strikers um, okay. at the time, and 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 when they won that grand final in '97, um, that was actually the first jersey because I collect jerseys. I've got like over 60 jerseys um, in in my cupboard, which the missus is not. <laughs> you don't have, you don't have my one yet. You haven't got my one. <laughs> That was the first jersey I bought, and um, yeah, because of Frank Farina. Farina, yeah. He was like an icon for me growing up in Cairns. Um, but that was kind of the age where I really started setting goals and 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 visualizing that I wanted to become professional. So that's nearly a light bulb moment at twelve when you sort of realised yeah, football's actually what I'm good at and what I want to do. Yeah, definitely. And I had like a best mate growing up, Zenon Caravalla, who, you know, is still a really good friend of mine and he's up there with an academy at the moment. Um, but yeah, we were, you know, and, and that was actually Frank Freena's um, nephew as well. So um, yeah, growing up, we just had that insight to what it would be like to be professional because he was playing in Europe at the time, um, bossing it overseas. So yeah. Is it, um, is, it, is it fair to say that your career pretty much started at 12 years old? I touched on it last week saying that I felt at six years old, I knew what I wanted to do. I said it as an unplayed, unpaid player as a joke, but is it fair to say that your career really didn't start when you came to Sydney? It started way before. Uh, look, Sydney, I, I knew that if, because I saw a lot of talented players growing up in Cairns, far north Queensland, and I knew... Um, as soon as, because I was out of the QAS system, you know, 14, 15, 16, and then I had to make a decision. I remember they didn't have funding or with Gary Phillips in, in Brisbane. And, and then I had to make a decision, either stay in Cairns or, or take the punt. And it was actually through uh, one of um, Raul Blanco's uh, friends that, that scouted me at a game at Sydney University when, when I first moved. And I was playing against uh, Fraser Park and um, Raul was actually looking at Daniel Schwartzer, which is Mark Schwartz's his brother. brother. And so that 90 minutes changed my game. Like, And then he invited me to come to Marconi. And, but without that performing in that 90 minutes, um, you know, who knows where I would have been in Sydney. If it's one of those, um, it's one of those right place at the right time. Let's just say you didn't play as well or the night before you've rolled an ankle. It's just, yeah, it's, it's just crazy. Time. Timing. Football, timing, yes, exactly. Football's all about timing. Now, I've got uh, 2002 was your Seva and Swadey's first encounter. Now, do you want to tell us the story, Seva? Because I know you're pretty excited about it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, I must have come back from a season overseas and uh, there's, a, there's a, I think you mentioned him earlier, Grant Last. You ended up living with him in North Parramatta, closer yeah. for you, correct? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and um, I remember walking in there, go up the stairs, and hey, Lasty, how you going? He's like, come out the balcony. So I see Thwaity out in the balcony, you know, smiling. <laughs> I was just, yeah, like he makes you smile. Just yeah, him, yeah, look at him. And I remember Lasty saying, oh, come over, look at the unit, you know, yeah, so that went around, bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, whatever. And um, I remember walking into Thwaity, I didn't know it was his room, but I, I, I walked in closed the door and on the back of the door I saw uh, it would have been an A4 paper am I, am I right? You that's it I got it here There's oh the stop there. it yeah. <laughs> and how, so, how old were you then Twady? here's one we prepared earlier <laughs> <laughs> and how, how old were you then? yeah so that was uh, my second year in university so I would have been yeah just about to turn 19 
Yeah, and I, I remember uh, reading it, and I, 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 am I am I right in saying under twenties? making the under 20s or 23s and cementing a spot at Marconi. Is that one of the first ones? Yeah, so initially, like, it was like a four-year plan. And, um, yeah, it was actually Peter Kelly who got me onto it. He was one of the high-performance um, people in the Socceroos um, at the time. But yeah, he was just, like, set, set some goals. And then, yeah, it, it began with, like, making the university first team and then getting a scholarship at university, making, like, the, the youth team at Marconi first and then, uh, yeah, getting getting my debut in the soc- in the in the first grade team uh, and then making the under 20. Um, yeah, so I, I ticked a lot of them. Um, I think in 2014, I wanted to make that squad for Athens, but I actually made the camp before and then I got cut. But that's, you know, that's I, I really like to talk about, you know, resilience and, and obviously re- refocusing your goals and, you know, within months, the next year in 2005, I made the Socceroos. So, right. um, and and Frank Farina, who cut me for the Athens Olympics, he picked me for that first camp uh, in June 2005. So, it goes <laughs> your, your idol, <laughs> yeah, you're <laughs> from your idol. Oh yeah. wow! And and mate, that's so so goal settings obviously was a big thing uh, that shaped your career, and we, we will touch on it later. But that's football which is a business you've started up is is that does that also you tell people to set goals and and all that sort of stuff as well and when you're mentoring those younger players now yeah so mainly that's football is a mentoring company helping people transition into a profession and and basically it's i just see like just say you're a student and you're looking you know to get into profession or you're an adult and you just you know covid's hit you made you've been made redundant which actually happened to me just recently okay um and you know what are you going to do next so i found this cycle that i've used in my own career it it can actually work to help transition so basically i've got like six topics where it's like learning about your values and introducing yourself and you're making your first impressions then like goal setting like setting goals for for that workplace or team or whatever and then obviously you become you mold yourself into a leader and and talk about leadership obviously with leadership and goal setting comes failure like i talked about with athens and and not making that and then obviously when you're failing you go through mental health so that's another section and then obviously to get through mental health you need resilience you need to overcome those things so that's that's my last topic about resilience so yeah that's that's kind of the cycle that i use and, and I'm seeing many people can use in their own workplace. Yeah, perfect. And, th- and that's where a team environment comes from, right? You've been in a team environment what since you've basically your, your whole career and, and you've taken all that out and put it into a purpose on how to help other people as and you're moving forward doing that, right? Yeah, and it's, it, it, it's an emptiness. It's, it's, you know, like when I, when I first came out of profession, professional football and then going into semi-pro, and then, you know, this year, probably moulding out a semi-pro, um, it's, it's an emptiness. And, and, and there's a, you know, it's a silence that you need to replace with, with something else, you know. I remember, um, I don't know if uh, this will ever touch you because you're so heavily involved into it and you've probably, you're mentoring every single day. Uh, but I remember when I, when, I, when I left the Gold Coast or when it folded, I had a chance to go to Newcastle. I didn't take it for the reason why I wanted to start a family and stuff like that. But what I, I – this is just me speaking open and, like, I could have detached myself from waking up, uh, waking up and going to work and I couldn't detach myself from thinking, geez, I, 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 was, a, I was a professional footballer a couple of months ago. Um, so what I actually – I just couldn't kick it. I just felt I kept waking up as a professional footballer, but I knew I'd be getting up at 4.30 to go to work. Driving a truck. Driving a truck. So, which led... Please tell me you're going to tell me that truck story as well. (laughs) (laughs) I'll tell you that one as well. Um, And what I found myself doing, Thwaity, not with you, because I I, I connected with you on a level that was just had nothing to do with, with football, but I decided to have minimal contact with anyone that had anything to do with professional sport because every time I, I made contact with the person it was a beacon of what I previously was, was. and I couldn't move on I I, it, it, I don't know if, if you had the same if it's had a, an effect on you just yet or it hasn't set in and maybe not but I, I got over that by sort of disconnecting myself but now I've reconnected because 
I run my own business. I'm happy. And yeah, it, yeah I'd had no mentor. I would have loved to have, you know what I mean? Um, um, uh, had help, but I think that's the only way I, yeah. I handled it. Oh, that's a fantastic point. And I guess um, the more I, I think about 90 minutes, because we're, we're in tune, you know, training, playing, you know, you're talking, I played 18 years getting paid for it on that 90 minute performance. Anything like now that I'm doing, you know, six, seven, eight hour days, I did a 12 hour day the other, the other month. And I, mate, I was, I was nearly dead. Yeah. Knackered. And, but this is the reality in the real world. Like, so anything outside of that, what you're saying, that mold of that player, that 90 minutes, it's exhausting, you know, yeah. like, and I guess it, it's about your ego as well. Like what, you know, every time someone asks you, you know, you know, what do you do? What, you're, you're Michael, the footballer. I was going to touch on that too, Swadey. You'd get, like, I ask you, and, and especially coming from a socceroo, mo- most people look at you and go, you're Michael Thwaite, the socceroo. And then you're obviously then worried about if you're on a building side or you're at the shop and you're dropping the kids off at school, there's always, you're worried about oh, someone's coming up, oh, Michael, you're not playing football anymore. So there's always a question about your football career. And, and the hardest thing as well, you know, in the last two years, especially in a place like Queensland, Gold Coast, where it's, okay, more NRL. Like if I was an NRL player, it'd be probably different, but it's different when you're in Sydney, Melbourne, you, you're known more, but the reality is no one really cares that much. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, you know? But and, is that you putting more pressure on yourself then as well? Yeah, and to feel that, like you've got this, you're, you're walking around and, and your expectations of, of how people treat you, people are ringing you up, agents are ringing you up, um, news report, you're on Fox Sports and whatnot. And then when there's nothing, but it takes you, it it, it takes you a while to get over that and realize shit. Like people don't care. People don't care. They they don't care. It's like me this year, I'll make a call on, on, on me playing. But the reality is it might be news for a day. It might be news for a week. Yeah. The reality is there's, there's a better player. There's a new younger player coming up who deserves to be in that, in, in that role now. That's you. The reality is I'm a father. Yeah. Yeah. Like but a, it's it's big I'm news a, for you. Yeah. For you per, right. Like you said, 18 years. <laughs> yeah. Of, but, you know, you, you announce it on a Tuesday and by Thursday, Friday, yeah, it's, you get calls and that, but then Monday comes and you're, yeah, yeah. no one cares. You're though. back working that's full time. Biggest, that's my biggest key to, to transition. And, you know, regardless of what my company does or if you can find, I've, I've actually started working out since I was seven, like you got what you're saying, what your values are, your family values that you've learned and your personal values. So for me, I'll call it the three C's. So every day that I wake up, as long as I'm committed, communication, compromise and element of surprise. So I work on those, those values that I've, I've created for myself. And as long as I align that with the place that I'm working with, the club that I'm playing with, the person that I want to relate with, I think you'll, you'll, you That's pretty get good. through that transition. Mate, it's, but, it, it's great advice. Hey, can you send me a text after with that? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome it's advice. Easier. It's, and, and it's for relationships as well, you know. Like if, yeah. if you want that relationship to work, you know, you know, you need those C's to be working, you know. And the same on the pitch as well. You need to be talking. You need to, you know, if you make a mistake, you need someone else to compromise for you. You need, if you, you need to be committed to a tackle or whatever. It, it's... And, and surprise, like, what are you going to do extra for the team? What are you going to do extra for your wife? Are you going to give her flowers for Valentine's Day? Are you going to give her, you know, like... Did you give her flowers? Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's my values. And now I've found the company, it's in sports disability. That's that's what I'm doing outside of, of football. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so supporting disabled athletes and disabled adults in the community here in the Gold Coast. Yeah. But the, the company has very similar values to mine and, and that's why it's aligning, you know? Good synergy. I'll ask you both this, right, just, just off the top of my head. With being a professional athlete and being involved in a team environment, right, so you're involved seven days a week in a team environment, is it the dressing room you miss? So is it the banter? right of turning up the training the banter the supplied session so you know exactly what's happening each day but is it the the change room that you miss being around the boys all that sort of stuff yeah i mean for me i haven't really got out of that this this year might be my first year um getting out of that but i'm still training at the moment with gold coast united and and i guess if i didn't have that uh, i think you know that that would be a hard um 
difference, you know, in my life. But speaking to people that, you know, for example, Zenon, who stopped playing, who's, who's one of my best mates, you know, talking to you, um, Seva, it's, I think it is that environment because there's so much that goes on within that um, change mm. room. And once, you know, once, once that changes, I hear that, you know, it almost takes two, three years to get out of that. Yeah. It's almost like a two year window where people are lost, uh, right? Yeah, that are lost, empty, you know, like that's, that's, that's what I could um, call it. Well, that's where you go from being professional to playing semi pro. And then once, you know, semi pro one or two years, like you're saying, that two year time frame, you're probably at that point where you are now where you go, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm all right. I'm all right with this, it, uh, you know? Yeah. Look, if you need any help, you can come down and play park football with Sever. I think I've just I've I've got in his ear. He might be coming to play for. He's coming for a run Thursday night. Is that right? I, I think that's a good point because you know my brother-in-law. He came from the UK and stayed with us. And he's looking around my house, and he's like, "What's your hobby? What do you do? What do you What do you like to do?" Yeah. And and I thought about. It. I'm like, mate, I've got an 18 year hobby. It's football. Yeah. So basically, you got to turn your profession, what you're getting paid for into a hobby, I think. Because when we were seven, we turned a hobby into a profession. Yeah. And I think you just look at it the other way. And I think that's what it will become for me. Because, yeah, in the last two years, I played for Gold Coast United at a semi-pro level. And I'm very grateful that I had that opportunity because some people go from pro and don't really have the transition out into anything. Um, but, yeah, I, I want to play. I want to start playing just for fun. Like, at the moment, I'm just training, and, and I love that. I, I love not having to perform on the weekend and having that weekend time. So I guess it's probably turning that that um, profession into a hobby. It sounds like you're actually in the midst of your own transition right now, eh? I can think oh, of sure. myself four years ago, five years ago, where I re- when, I first, when I started my business, that's when I was at my most happiest. Like, it took me a while, eh? To, but, yeah, it sounds like you're going... You're going through it right now, like yeah. the middle of it, and yeah, it looks like you'll be right. Yeah, I, th- I think you'll be all right, mate. Now, we're, we're just uh, moving on from that, I can now see why you basically captained all the teams you played for in Australia. So you talk about pretty much setting goals, all that sort of stuff. You captained the Wanderers, you captained Gold Coast, you captained Melbourne Victory, and captained Perth Glory. So I, I think we can see why. Yeah, I, you, like literally talking to him now. On, well, on in five minutes, you know, it doesn't take much for a for a person to rub off on, on another. Yeah, and, and I can see why the gaffer and, and why the CEO would want someone like him as a, a as the leader of their club. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. being captain. <laughs> Being a leader, but so so being a leader in a professional environment, I, I, is it hard work? So does it make like you, your like, day harder? Do you put out fires that no <laughs> one sees? Oh, for sure. Like I think my, my most challenging time, I'd say it was between Gold Coast United folding with, with, with the young team and, you know, dealing with Clive Palmer and, and, and Miron as, as the coach, um, Mike Mulvey and, and, you know, signing off to the FFA um, and then obviously between that time when you're trying to lead a young team and you know the club's going to fold um, and getting players to, to commit right to the end of the season. And and I compare that to, you know, almost winning a championship with Perth Glory after a long time and being the captain there. I set all these goals for the team, you know, individual goals, my own goals with the coach, Kenny Lowe. And at the end of it, we had a salary cap scandal so we lost all of our points and we were um you know relegated to seventh position just missing the finals to have that taken away when you're top of the table yeah because of an administration fault that's when the true true characters and, and even i learned so much because i really you know i went into the office and you know i i, I started taking it out on kenny Lowe and the assistant coach and then when i reflected i, I apologized to him because I actually learned so much from him um, during that time because he was he was the leader as a coach and he got us through that time and then put that onto me as the captain, you know, when you're playing for nothing and you've lost all your points. Yeah. So I guess learning in those moments, in those failures, which I like to talk about, um, you accept it and then it builds you as, as a character. 
that's perfect. Let, let, let's talk about a couple of failures then. I've, I've got written down here, obviously you're a squad member of, of three World Cups, is that right? But didn't go to... Yes, I've qualified for three World Cups. Um, that's yeah. not a failure in my eyes. No, no, honest. but he talked about it before how he picks himself yeah. up and goes again, right? So not, right? not hitting the goals Hit that it, you... Okay. Yeah, so not hitting yeah. the goals. So, yeah, so Unfortunately, I didn't yeah, go to one World Cup, which... Um, yeah, but look, the more I think about it, one game for the Socceroos... I, Probably could have died a happy person. Yeah, yeah and, and all of us would have. Oh, mate, <laughs> certainly a lot of us would. Now, is it? And and I've asked Seva this, a similar question, and and we've had some conversations around it. Is, is it? So let's go. If you because you didn't make the World Cups, was it because you? weren't in that echelon at the time or you weren't playing in Europe or you weren't playing in Australia it was just different times and you weren't in, in the in, in the window at the time is that is that what you put it down yeah, to the, the two biggest chances was probably um, for the 2014 World Cup um, when there was a changeover in coaches between Holger and Ange who knows if Holger stayed maybe I would have gone um, but yeah, the biggest chance was was in 2006 with the Golden Generation, where I was playing um, very regularly in Romania. Um, Gus hitting, you know, uh, taking over from Frank gave me gave me an opportunity, and he really wanted to blood, you know, like players like myself and Lubo Milicevic into the team. Um, and um, yeah, but I went through a political issue where I wanted to leave Romania. But again, it was the ego. It was like not reading contracts properly and and i got into an 11 month fifa case so i didn't play for the six months leading up to that world cup wow, you know, wow. I didn't know that. Who, who, yeah who's gonna as you know i was 22 at the time and who's who's gonna pick a player that hasn't played for six months um graham arnold did his best to look after me um but you're just rusty and you can't you couldn't perform and yeah. mentally i was just fragile and and that was the hardest moment because you know that 2006 World Cup. Yeah. Oh. It, was, it was the biggest thing. It was the biggest oh. moment for, for Australian football after qualifying with that team. And I was, you know, basically crying in cans. Um, yeah, that's what I was... Is that a dis, nearly a disappointment for you? Obviously not a disappointment with how we performed and whatever else, but is that a, a, a personal sort of hard thing to take? Huge. It's. Um, it, but as Seva mentioned before, it's uh, when we're talking, it's, it's, it's football because how many times have you been on the bench and you've kind of wanted the team to fail so you can play? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wicked psychology. And athletes are wired differently. It's, there you it's, go. It's, but I supported the Socceroos since I was, you know, since, since not buying those jerseys and watching every team, you know, you know leading up to when I debuted and supporting that jersey and supporting that culture. But then when you're in it, and f- having those mixed feelings, it's it's not healthy. It's not healthy, but yeah, like I, I celebrated how well we did at that World Cup, but then there's that burning feeling like what what could have been. I could have been there. Can we go back to the, can we go back to then the the celebrations after qualifying? Obviously, as a squad member on the bench. Um, I keep going it because I had long hair and yeah, and, and, <laughs> people wouldn't recognise you now. Yeah, just look over what? John Travolta's shoulder. Yeah, and and obviously John Travolta in the change rooms and all that. Like, just just give the viewers and and all that a little bit of insight into into how that was. Oh, look! After the game, I just remember because you know I grew up, you know, supporting those players in that change room and and just being part of that. You know, qualifying for the first time in thirty two years. I think it was just a relief for everybody. And um, you know, like I think I probably sunk about five beers within thirty <laughs> seconds. I think, but um, yeah, I mean, you just feel like you're top of the world, and you're thinking about oh, going to a World Cup and um, being part of this this generation that that was so successful. You know, all the the history behind the AIS and the development of of what what they've done and achieved, and uh, t- you know, it was it was celebrated. I remember um, Alex, I did an interview on sunrise the next morning because no one wanted to do the interview and I was like so hung over with Alex <laughs> Tobin and you know, that's, that's another captain that, that missed out on, on qualifying. But I remember being seedy and, and just the next day and yeah, it was just such a relief for everyone. Everyone felt the boost of that World Cup, eh? Like oh, that, mate. That, that qualifying, like, we needed it and it came at the right time. It, 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 we didn't just qualify against uh, Iran or something. It was it was Uruguay. It was a great team. It, it was an absolute quality team. Can you give us a bit of insight then into into Gus Hiddink and, and what he did 
<laughs> for that team. And, and and is he as good as everyone says he is? Yeah. I'll give you an example, right? Um, after my first game against Jamaica, um, you know, I was buzzing. We won 5 nil. just had your first game for Australia. And he pulled me aside and he showed me a clip. So Graham Arnold was there as well, got him to do the DVD um, at the time. And then, um, yeah, he was slow mo, like he put it on slow motion during corners. And I had long hair and a hairband, right? And he paused it and he said, what can you tell me about this? And I said, what do you mean? I'm, I've got goal side, I'm looking, I'm good position. You know, I was 21, 22 at the time. And he's like, look what you're doing with your hair. You're fixing it up against a better team. They're going to punish you. If, if you concentrate on your hair, yeah. He's like, next camp, cut your hair. And, uh, <laughs> really? So you pretty much said you're coming in, but cut your hair. <laughs> yeah, cut, cut your hair. And so what I did, like I did the dumb and dumber thing. I just went like this. The bowl. The oh, dropped, I, I left like a whole mullet and just cut it. And, and Goose looked at me the next camp. Uh, he's like, mate, what are you doing? And I remember telling him the story because we had the 10-year or 15-year anniversary after qualifying. And Goose came back and I said, do you remember about the DVD? And he's like, yeah, I remember, but I was only joking. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, um, yeah but it, it goes to show the attention to detail. Basically, he, um, in our first camp in Netherlands, um, because he was still coaching with PSV at the time, I remember it was the hardest training ever, and he just leveled the playing field. Did, didn't, it doesn't matter if you're um, Tony Popovich, Craig Moore, um, you know, Lucas Neal, Harry Kuehl, Baduka, it's it, he leveled the playing field young old he had a massive camp and you know he got the team fit you know i remember him talking to like mark baduka about losing weight and you know the next camp he did and everyone was on board you know so that's where you talk presence hey eh? he can come yeah in. presence and he can just yeah level playing field you're talking players with millions of dollars big egos yeah. and yet just for the common goal you know you'd, you'd fold for him any day because of what he'd done yeah, he's just so prepared. And I remember, like, I heard Arnie talking about on the, the series they did with Fox and the day before, he knew, like, we did the, the shape, you know, with Kuehl on the bench and, uh, you know, he, he had a plan and, you know, made us do penalties before. Like, he, he just knew things. I guess that's the coach. He's got the instinct, the smell, you know. It's, yeah. it's just experience, I guess, at that level. Not everyone could be a coach, eh? No. No, not everyone. I'm looking at you too. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> mate, wait till you see Thursday night. You, you are a different. I'm a different person coaching. It is the it is the hardest thing to do. Like to get thirty blokes up every week. It's it's especially the blokes that around us fair income. <laughs> um, so, wait, do you want to touch on? So, like your your company that's football is obviously helping people transition and all that. And I want to ask you about China. Uh, and that's your last overseas destination. Am I, am I right with saying that? Yeah, so that was in 2016. And then, yeah, I followed after that. I, I went to West Sydney in, in 2017, 18. So, um, yeah, it was basically two years away from my, from my young family. Yeah, and, and how hard's that for you then? And, and obviously your wife and kids. That's obviously pretty, like, you're in another country, right, playing football with your family back here? Yeah, I mean, I can't explain how hard it was, like, you know, if I look at my hands, I can count the number of days um, that I saw my family in that year. And uh, I guess, look, that's 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 where it gets hard for me. And you know, I don't I don't want to actually get teary about this, but I've suffered anxiety, you know, severe anxiety my whole career, and it's something that I talk openly about in my mentoring. Um, but yeah, like there was one moment in the in China. Um, you know, where it really came to a head, I was, you know, I was, you know, I was on and off medication. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of was sorting that out at, towards the end of Perth. And, um, but when you're, when you've just tapped into, you know, psychologists and, and whatnot, medication, and then you go to a foreign country like China, where the climate's different, you're away from family, you're isolated, um, you're not on medication, those things um, that are helping you or you're initially trying to get you to a better place. There was this, uh, I think it was one of the biggest um, Hiltons in China. And I was actually looking out one day, it was before a game and, you know, I was, I was really snowballing, you know, um, where I could feel, you know, that depressive state and um, performing on the pitch, no problem, but off, off the pitch, this was the problem. I was looking out 
And in China, there's no real, you know, health and safety. And I looked across at the building and we were 50 odd stories up, the biggest, one of the biggest buildings I've seen. Um, and I looked across and there was these workers just hanging off the building, just unharnessed, not like in Australia, you know, where you need, you know, the, the sign off and everything. And they were just like, almost, if, if you tip over, they'll, they'll, they'll die basically. And I'm sure it's happened in China. And I kind of zoomed in and I was like, I, I felt at the moment, like, that's me. Like, honestly, I could either, I, I was having suicidal thoughts and, and wow. you know, I, I had everything. I had everything. I had the finance, I had the wife, a house, car, career, everything. And to have those thoughts, I, I honestly just, I, I ran to my phone and I just thought, I just ran, rang Chantel, my wife, and I just thought, I'm having these thoughts. And she's just like, get the home, you know, like, what are you doing? But, you know, I was, I was signed two years in, in, in China. That was only my first year during the time. Um, but I guess if you put yourself in that environment, you know, you can see, you know, like talking about mental health, you know, I think one in four um, Australians suffer from anxiety and, you know, one in seven depression, over eight people commit suicide every day in Australia. Like, wow. you can see, you know, that it can get to that level. And, and, you know, that's why I like talking about it because it was such a terrible time for me. And that's what we want to highlight too on this podcast, right? On Like with our guests, exactly yeah. what he's spoken about. Can I... Ha- how did you perform then on the pitch? Like with those thoughts, like you're training, you're away from the family, but yet you put in on the pitch and you and you did everything that you were asked of. So like, talk us through that. It, it was frightening because um, I was so sick off the pitch in my apartment, like just, just you know, in this world of like, I don't know, just destroying my own mind. And But on the pitch, it was like, again, it comes down to that 90 minutes. Like it was something that is brewed, in me since I was, you know, you know, first in the NSL and just having difficult coaches and just switching off and getting up. the job it's done. Just like a switch, like where yeah. I was, it's that white line fever. And honestly, it was one of the best seasons I've had. Like I, I had, you know, scored three goals. I was playing more of a defensive midfielder, which I probably should have played more of as, as, as a player, but, but then to be so sick off the pitch and, you know, obviously I had, um, James Trissy in the first six months and then Dario Vidicic in the second. And when I talked to them about this, they, they, they were shocked. They didn't know because wow. you know, no one no one lets you know, you know, when they are in those moments and, yep. and thinking like that. And oh. I guess, you know, Chantel took it all on herself, you know. And, he, and is that who helped you get through then? Chantel, obviously, you're on the phone to her a lot, I dare say. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like when I when I when I came back from from China and it was the end of 2016, so started 2017. I was so sick. I, I saw, I basically saw a psychiatrist, which is the doctor of psychology, like the top level, like almost hospitalised. Um, but the funniest thing is, well, so like I was in this hospital and I and and we're going through the analysis and stuff, and she basically laughed at me. She's like, "What are you doing here?" And, 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 and that, that moment kind of, and I thought, mate, it's right. I shouldn't be here. I don't need to be in the hospital. I'm physically, I'm moving. I'm not like bedridden. I'm not, you know, it's, it's, it's just anxiety. And, and I realized, you know, like anxiety is always going to be there with me. It's just, you know, maintaining it. And, and, you know, I, I don't take medication at the moment. Um, not saying that's the answer, but um, yeah, it's just, you know, doing, getting the balance right with your family and the environment, um, what you're doing for work, um, having that purpose in life, you know, searching for your own values. But yeah, I mean, when I came back, I, I was sick, you know, and, but the problem for me is that I wasn't ready to finish professionally. Mm. And I put myself in, a, in another environment, which was West Sydney, which was the closest because Perth Glory wanted to sign me, but it was too far. My fam, Chantel decided to have the kids in, in, Can, uh, in, uh, in Gold Coast um, after moving from Cairns. And then um, I spent my second year away, which was even worse. It was so close at West Sydney Wanderers. And, you know, it was cruel, but they never let me have, like, recovery sessions off. So basically, I, you know, me, Seva, I, I caught up with you and I was talking to you about it. And basically she was saying, get home. Like, I lost money being at West Sydney Wanderers. didn't make one cent. I lost so much money by how expensive it was in Sydney living my family living in Gold Coast and then obviously traveling, you know, every three weeks, you know, on recovery sessions some days trying to get back and 
it was it was shambles, you know. So just paying like just paying your own way home just to be able to see the family. Just seeing like desperate and and being like not well mentally, you know, yep. as well. So, but no one would know that like when you're playing for Wanderers or. But I, I remember Swayde just to cut in. I remember you played a game at Suncorp and. They wanted him to literally get on a flight with the team and his family were 40 minutes away. Uh, do you remember yeah, that one? Am I right? And and for me, like, and, and that was under Gombao um, yeah. when, when he took over from Papa. But, um, you know, even like something like that, I was like, yeah, you know that I'm going to do, because I'm religious, you know, like even after trainings now, I still go in the pool. Yeah, and do your recovery. But, like I, I'd do the right things. All I wanted is that recovery session off and I know that I'd, I recover better than, you know, 80% of the players anyway. See, but. back then, let's just say they thought Michael Thwaite will be mentally better if we give him two days off. Yeah, and you know what I mean? Like, it would have done you the world of good, the team world of good, but this and that's day of a, age, yeah. It's, and that's a good that's question. Football. That's football. Yeah, and, and that's a good question, right? So I'll, I'll ask you this. Do you think now in the professional environment that football in this country is that they do enough for not – the mental state of footballers like I know that there's a lot of footballers living away from home especially young ones now in the A-League post-COVID so there's a lot of young footballers I don't know what they're earning they might not be earning a whole heap of cash and all that sort of stuff do you think that at the moment football like the head of football are looking after these these younger players look the PFA do their job they, they do their job they obviously the, the players are funding that the the federations are funding that. The TV rights are funding it. Um, they do a great, you know, like they they're, they're pushing people into direction. But let's just say, you know, when when you have to go through it yourself, like to to you know, you you, do, you go through an induction, which is better than the old NSL, and then they put you in a, an outduction. But then there's nothing. I think there's a huge gap in a network of of retired players or mm. whatever people. Um, we we need to connect with each other somehow because there's so many there's so many people lost out there. It's not funny. Like, not everyone has a partner that you know has a job, a secure job when you're finished. Or there's so much pressure, you know, with kids when when it does end. Yeah. Um, but yeah, obviously when you're in the environment, you know, they give you the study grants. They 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 tick all the boxes. But it's I guess it's you know it, the the getting to professional. And, and out of professional, that's where the gaps are, I think. So I guess, I guess that's where I want to help um, with, with my own company. Like obviously, I'm only one person, but there is a, a shitload of funding that, that goes towards that. Um, and as Seva said, you know, like it's almost, we, we say it's full time, but let's be honest, compared to Europe, it's it's probably not. It's you know? so, um, and, and it's a great opportunity. Like post COVID, it's a great opportunity for the value of the A League has gone down, but. Um, you know the, the highlight of this second division and MPL structure, and um, it's it's all coming to a head. So it's like an, it's like they've nearly hit the reset button, and we're and we're, and we're all starting all over again. Yeah, well, we've been talking about it, but I guess you know it's it's we need people to action. Like, yeah. I, I think like the way forward would be maybe you know to you know, like for me, like I'm associated with Gold Coast United, and and I love the club. I've had a history with the club. I've played again for the club. But hopefully it's a long-term thing, you know, where I'm involved, even if I'm not playing. Yep. But, you know, like a lot of people, ex-pros or whatever, they, they, they say something, but they're actually not actioning. They're not helping a club for free or yeah. not for free. Or, you know, like I think it's about there's so many players out there and participation is so huge, but it's almost like, yeah, you need to do your bit by action. I think that's the best thing about leadership. Yeah, and uh, very well said. Now you're also asking footballers uh, for their that's football moment. Am I right? That's right. Yeah. So basically, I yeah, I've I've got I think I've had about sixteen stories so far. But and that's what I wanted to ask. Sev, I I wanted to ask you, what is your that's football story? Uh, my football story is I'll take it back to two thousand and one when I. Moved overseas to Piacenza. I remember I was doing very well in the youth team. I broke a couple of records and my agent at the time, who was an Australian living in Italy, he, he, he rang me one day and goes, oh, I'll, I'll see you at the first team game. I said, yep, no worries. He goes, I've got someone coming with me. All right, no worries. Uh, in the papers all week, what happened was, um, uh, actually that was Serie B. The, the, the coach at the time was Novellino. 
And they pretty much, in Italian, they call it a blank check where they say, listen, go buy who you want, when you want. There's no, there's no problems of money. We need to go up, all right? So what happened was things weren't going to plan. They were sitting, I think, they were sitting maybe third or fourth, the first team were. And so my agent gets there and he goes, oh, come to the offices, you know? And I go to the offices, and right in front of me was uh, Luciano Spalletti, who's coach Roma, Udinese, Inter Milan, uh, Zenit, St. Petersburg. And I, I had no idea that my agent was his agent as well. So I said, what's he doing here? And he goes, well, the talk of the town is, is uh, if, if Piacenza draw today, no, if they, if they, if, I think if they lose or draw, e- either way, they needed to win. If not, Novellino's gone and Spalletti, and I'm thinking, oh, beautiful. My agents, you know, this is going to be pretty awesome for me. By Monday, I'll be sweet. So anyway, I remember, um, I think the game was against Torino. Uh, Piacenza goes down 1-0. I'm sitting literally next to, I've got Inzaghi's agent named Tinti, me, Spalletti, and my agent. And I... They were smoking cigars in, in winter time and the, the, the smell was killing me. But I'm like, nah, this, this is awesome. I'm sitting next to like royalty here, you know? And I know what's going on. The crowd started to turn against Novellino, who wasn't well liked. He used to scream at the old men who used to come and watch the training, four or 500 people. And if he didn't like him smoking a certain cigar and he'd literally lose a day, this guy wow. had no manners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was unbelievable. Um, so we go down one nil. Um, and then the crowd just started to turn. Second half comes, and uh, it was like 93rd minute. He's made a sub. He's made a sub, right? And uh, and just before he's made the sub, Luciano Spalletti turns to me and says, um, "Text your parents and say that tomorrow your life's going to change. I'll, you're an instant millionaire right now." And I remember, I remember opening up my Motorola. My Motorola flip top, and I remember texting my mum saying, "Hey, mum, um, life's about to change for all of us." And she said, "Why?" I said, "Novellino's about to get the sack here. We're we're, we're set. We're sweet." Yeah. Um, he, I had, I was going to get a, 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 another four year extension, a deal, like yeah. massive money. He puts on this player Raz Telly. When I mean, they tried to play the offside trap. <laughs> this Don't. guy was six or seven meters offside. I'm telling you, it, it, it was an absolute joke. Even though we, we scored and we drew the game, Novellino kept his job, but the whole crowd literally turned against him and because no one wanted this guy's coach, eh? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, so it really didn't look too good on me that I was sitting with the potential next coach. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, and that's where maybe it went a little bit wrong for me. I don't know, but I mean, that's, that's football. That's, that's, that's my football moment. And it could have turned out very different right now. <laughs> Wow, I told you we'd get it out of him, Spidey. Yeah, yeah, so there you go. I mean, yeah, it's, it, that's the beauty of the game. And, and that's, like, my brand, that's that's what it means. Like, it's, it means that's life, you know? Like, and, um, yeah, there's so much, like, behind my, yeah, my, my, my structure, my brand and stuff like that. But, yeah, it's it's amazing story. Yeah. Uh, we've all got it, don't we? There's, yeah. Oh. Yeah. And you know what? We, we, we might ask a couple more guests, Heidi, if, we, if, if you don't mind. Ask for their That's Football moment and send, and send oh. it up to you if you don't mind. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That would be, be amazing. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's basically I want to help people in that transition, you know, like because there's so many different stories and, um, you know, like I might go to other codes as well because I guess football, you can, you know, it might be AFL or rugby league and, you know, the more, you know, even in Gold Coast, I meet so many different people, Um uh, in, in the game it's, it, you could nearly blanket it as professional athletes right that yeah, that once yeah, they lose sure. that w- w- once they lose that structure in their life and have to go and support them support their own structure is is probably where some certain sports are breaking down no doubt yeah yeah. for now like I'm just focusing on on more schools because it works with my family yeah. I want to help people get you know to, to a profession that they actually enjoy because I don't know how many people um, you know my first kind of role outside of pro, pro football um, you know, a year ago was at an Orbitz Elevators. You know, he was one of our sponsors, and I was in HR, and it was it was it was hard because it was a big company. I was stuck in a room, and it was just complete opposite to what I'm doing now in disability sports, uh, where I'm out and about and driving people around and doing sports and outdoors more more what I'm used to. You know, mm. so I guess it takes time, as you said. I might take a couple of years to to find that. 
How good? Yeah, that's good. That's why a lot of our guests, for example, we've got Martin Lang coming on, which obviously we both know yeah. from our Gold Coast days. Um, we've got uh, we've got a couple of NRL players yeah. and ex players and that. So every it, it, you don't have to have you know football. It, it's all walks of life. You know whether it's in an organisation, it, mental health is the number one thing, isn't it? It, it, look at and, and everyone at, at some point is going to suffer from it and mate we, look we, we really appreciate you being so open and honest with us today uh, and especially uh, our first guest on Head O and Sever Uncharted mate you've certainly taken us down a um uh, a road that we hope is an eye opener for a lot of people and look we can't thank you enough for being so open and, and giving yeah. and giving yourself and lot to us here now and and the viewers so uh, mate we can't thank you enough mate yeah, my, my pleasure and I guess, you know, whether it be my company or me as a player and, you know, like I, I just wanted to be known as a, as a good person on and off the pitch and, you know, I, I think the biggest thing for anyone, any individual, you know, talking about, you know, ego as a footballer or you as a worker is, is just to believe in yourself and I guess, you know, that's that's what I've done in, in, in my career and, you know, trying to do in my, my, next, my next life basically and, um, is just to have that belief in yourself. Uh, Thwaiti, you're on all socials, aren't you? Uh, for example, someone wants to p- pick up the phone, direct yeah, message just, you. I mean, that's another topic in itself, social it's media. media. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, to do with mental health and in schools and stuff like that. That's, I, I find it hard to kind of push myself. But, yeah, I'm just I'm, – I'm on at Instagram – um, at that's football MT, but, yep. um, and we'll tag uh, we'll tag Twady in all our Instagram posts over the next coming coming yeah, days so that people can follow it. Such an honest and open bloke, mate. Like that. It's if he can help, I'm sure you'd be able to. Eh? It doesn't matter if where they are in the country. You know, you're you're I mean, an outlet yeah, for people. W- that was one of the hardest things for me in China because it was one of the first times I remember Jimmy Trissi got me onto Instagram because I never used to post anything about my career. But all I was doing was on social media and it was just like in this wormhole of you got you know, stuck. disaster, you know? Yeah. And uh, so that's where, you know, it's a bit of a, you know, I, I wanted to do it without any social media. But mm. then how do, how do you get the message out there? Yeah. Everybody's on it, you know? So that's where I'm at, you know? So yeah. It's, it's a balancing um, act, right? On on how much social media and, and, and where you need to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't have, yeah, I don't have... Um, someone in an admin support that, can, that is good at it. It's just me, you know, it's your start of your business. You gotta, you gotta tick all your boxes, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. Seva, look, it's been a great conversation. Oh, um, and I know, I know you and Thwaiti are good mates and, and all that. And it's been hard obviously to catch up during this COVID period, but uh, look, Thwaiti, we, th- well, I can't thank you enough for the chat, mate. You've been open and honest and uh, I know Seva appreci- appreciates it too, mate. Oh, massively. Like, I think we've, we've been mates now, what, close to 20 years now, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's oh. always been a pleasure. You know, you look at the smile on him. And yeah. How can you not want to walk in the net every day? <laughs> oh, how good. It was good. awesome. It was awesome playing with you at the same time, eh? Like, we play, actually, I played with him at Marconi as well in the NSL days. Yeah, so. So, Michael Thwaite, thank you for uh, your time on Hedo and Sever Uncharted today, mate. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Hedo. Thanks, Sever. I appreciate it, man. Anytime, any anytime you need my support and doing great things, um, I hope you go, guys go well. Thanks, mate. Re- you, really mate. appreciate it, Keep mate. Thank touch. you. Seva, how good's Michael Thwaite? Oh, he was brilliant, eh? Exactly what we, uh, I expected anyway. Yeah. Look, he's, uh, I know he's a good friend of yours, and uh, I did say that throughout the podcast, but uh, we can't thank him enough for being so open and honest with us, right? Exactly what we wanted our guests to do. Yeah, that's what we want. Like, we just want transparency. So we're here to give people a good listen and get the right people on. And uh, I think he was a great first one. Mate, it's a perfect first one. And again, like last week, we can't do this podcast without the wonderful people at Mate. Visit letsbemates.com.au, which you can see in the background. Uh, MG Active, who's still got Sever in shape. And the beer of choice for us at the moment is from Rusty Penny Brewing. So go and see them in in Dean Place. And uh, also the planning station. Yeah, mate, she's got a beautiful company going there. And if uh, if you ever need any event planning and that, just uh, go on the socials, uh, the planning station. And Maddie Clark at Little uh, Little Paper Boat Supply Company, who has helped us obviously get out with our logo. And we've got some air fresheners on the way. And also the best in the business, DS Tipping and Excavations. Yeah, mate. Very good.
You're the, Cheers, be- the, best in the, the best in the business. And also, we can't thank Jeff Lambert enough. And uh, if you need anything, go and visit jefflambert.com.au for any of your video photography needs. So, Jeff, we can't thank you enough. And um, we will see you guys in a couple of weeks. Thanks, thank ever. Thanks, mate. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And, uh, yeah, mental health's a big thing. So get behind people who, uh, who need the support. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.